It began with a simple request. Last year, a local activist named Tom McWright wanted to build an app for D.C. bikers, one that linked to the city's bicycle laws, so he asked the D.C. government for a digital copy of the D.C. Code, the official collection of all city laws from gun regulations to election rules to traffic laws. It turned out D.C. law could not be downloaded legally. The paper version clocks in at 23 volumes, and you can read it at the Martin Luther King Library or shell out $850 to actually buy it. You can find it online for free through dc.gov, but that version's controlled by a private publisher, and it cannot be downloaded. So, McWright and a team of like-minded activists and government workers set out to free the code. Last week, a new website called dcdecoded.org went live, promising to bring the laws of D.C. to, well, us non-lawyers. Joining us in studio to discuss this is Tracy Hughes. She is director of the D.C. office of Open Government. Tracy, good to see you again. Thank you. Nice to be here. Also with us is Seamus Kraft. He is executive director and co-founder of the Open Gov Foundation. Seamus Kraft, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And Josh Tauberer is a civic hacker and founder of GovTrack. Dot us. He did some consulting work for this project. Josh Tower, thank you for joining us. Good to be here. And V. David V. David Venich is general counsel with D.C. Council with the D.C. Council. David Venich, thank you for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me. You can join the conversation. It's 800-433-8850 or email to kodra at wamu.org. Have you tried to read or download the laws of your local jurisdiction? How did that work out for you? 800 800- Four three three eight eight five zero. Seamus, I'm not a lawyer, and for people like myself, the DC Code is not exactly a page turner. I don't know why David bought two <laughs> volumes of it here for me, as if I'm going to read it. <laughs> why is it important that this document be available for download? Well, the law is a is the source code of this community. Everything from parking rules to election laws, it's all in the code. And in this day and age, that's the most important information that you as a citizen would eventually need. And we wanted to use all the technology that we have at our fingertips today to make it fully accessible to you. And accessible means downloadable, searchable, and getting at understandable. So things like legalese and jargon, we can solve that with things like hover over definitions to help break down the barriers that exist between a citizen and this most important civic information. Josh Tabara, how did this site, dcdecoded.org, come into existence? How and why? Well, a year ago, Tom McWright was looking at uh, what was available and saw that the official website for the code had a terms of service agreement that made it illegal to copy, uh, and there were copyright considerations. And he started to ask uh, other activists who have worked on problems like this, how do we, how do we fix this problem? Uh, and he turned to, to Dave and asked, can we just get an electronic copy of the code? And uh, he wanted to take that copy and um, uh, mash it up and create something new out of it. Um, and so he talked to Dave and Tom talked to me and I talked to Tom and uh, we all thought about it. And uh, I worked with uh, Dave's office on getting the electronic documents, transforming them into a format that was more uh, usable for outsiders. And then Tom and other civic hackers in the community and Seamus got involved on taking these data files and, and building a really useful website out of it. Why did Tom McCrite want this document in the first place? Well, he was interested in the laws that govern him. He's a biker. He works for uh, a company that um, works on mapping products. And so he's interested in <clears throat> roads and transit. And, um, and, and the laws affect how we're able to uh, participate in our community and get to work and so on. Um, and, and issues of, of whether we can copy it and share these important laws is very galvanizing for a lot of geeks like Tom and myself. Tracy Hughes, you are the inaugural director of the D.C. Office of Open Government. What's your office supposed to do, and how does this website fit into that mission? Well, that's the $50 million question. Um, The office is uh, relatively new. Um, I'm the first person to actually be in that job, and I've been here for less than a year. So the mission of the office is to ensure that government operations at every level are are open and transparent, and ultimately um, all the information that's made available through the Office of Open Office of Open Government site is really meant to engage people with district government. 
Um, hence, the reason for uh, decoding the DC code, because ultimately what we want is for anyone who wants to access the district laws is to be able to understand them, because if people can understand them, they can better engage with our government and hopefully have an impact on the laws that are passed. 800-433-8850 is the number. Has technology um, made governments more open and more accountable, in your opinion? Give us a call, 800-433-8850. Send us a tweet at Kojo Show or email to org. David Svenich, you were a little bit skeptical mm-hmm. that there was a problem here in the first place because the DC code has always been, well, theoretically available <laughs> online, right. even if it was on a clunky website. But it's my understanding that you began to see it differently when you started to learn how to code yourself. What right. does this issue look like from within government? Well, uh, about a year ago, I got the, the phone call and the email from Tom McWright, and I basically stoned him. I didn't really <laughs> think that it was a big deal. I didn't see the, the utility of it. Um, and it was happy for everybody that I saw the light. Um, and since seeing the light, I've actually had a little bit of opportunity to do this myself. Um, and since doing it myself, I've realized that coding and uh, opening up the code has actually made my life as a government lawyer easier. Uh, frankly, I am a lawyer. I do use the code on a daily basis. Um, and the reason I brought two volumes of the DC code is to show you that if I wanted to research something simple, I would have to have two volumes of the code. I'd have the index and the code, and now I can use my phone. Um, And it's those types of advantages that uh, didn't exist a year ago that do. Um, And previously, I would have had to ask the vendor, could you uh, build an app for my phone? And I would have to pay money for it. I'd have to go through the procurement process. And now, because the code is available online, all I have to do is rely on people that are doing it themselves to make it available for me. Uh, And it's been a real uh, real learning experience, um, but something that's good for everybody, including the government. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the answer to the question, what happens when a lawyer walks into a bar and learns how to code? (laughs) (laughs) Tracy, David, you know that over the last five or six years, we've heard a lot about the power of open data and the web to make governments more accountable, more transparent. And we've heard a lot about how forward-thinking our local government here is in D.C. And we've heard that not just from officials, we've heard it from activists who work with them. And I'm trying to square that storyline with a more well-known series of stories about elected officials who've been sent to jail for corruption. What does it say about the efficacy of open government if all that open data exists side by side with corruption. In other words, do we know about the corruption because we have open institutions, or is the real nature of corruption so insidious that it can't be quantified with existing data sets? I'll start with you, David. <laughs> well, I, I probably can't answer the bigger question, Kojo, but uh, on the on the narrow set, I think that what is actually made open matters. Um, so, for example, the DC code was open. You could go on the Internet, you could look at it, Um, but it wasn't accessible in the way that people who wanted to use it could use it. Um, You couldn't download it. You couldn't link to it. um, And without being able to download or link to it, you can't actually access the bike laws. Um, So it's really important how you present uh, the data. And so it's not enough just to have the data available. It's also how you present that data that matters. Tracy? I I think the reason that you're seeing the um, discrepancy is that Um, When we talk about open government um, and open data under open government, um, that also implies a culture shift that must also take place. Um, As a government, we need to get away from, um, you know, wanting to harbor information, although the data is made available. It's really not going to be particularly useful if the only people who understand it are the people in the government who are generating it. Ultimately, and call me crazy, I think that the data that is made available, um, district uh, residents, the people who pay tax dollars, are the people who own that data. So they should be able to access it, um, understand it, and use it in a way that's helpful for them. Same question to you, frankly, Josh Tauber. Well, there are different types of open data that the government can produce. And um, on one end of the spectrum is data that helps educate the public about how to interact with their own government better, how to be better citizens in in a very broad sense. And I think that's the type of data that we've been working with on this project. There are a lot of other sorts of data, government spending data, like contracts, Um, and uh, uh, information about taxation and, uh, let's say, police and emergency response times. That sort of data can go towards accountability, and and there can be more resistance there from government to get access to it. Um, But for information about the laws, there's usually much less resistance, and, and the benefit is very different and very powerful, very broad. 
Seamus, if I want to be the Seamus that tracks down corruption in the D.C. government, does this help? I think it does. And I think the, the important thing to realize is that you can have a digital snow job just like governments can pour paper at reporters or citizens who are looking for answers, you can do the same thing with open data. You can pour APIs over the transom and force somebody to search through open data sets till they die. What we've done here with the DC code is put a really useful application on top of that open data. So this is something, if you can use Google, you can use this. And when you see your elected officials acting in a way that might not be consonant with what you want or expect or deserve from them, you can come up here and actually look at their job description very quickly and easily. And you don't have to be a web developer or a software geek to do it anymore. On to the telephones. We'll start with Holly in Silver Spring, Maryland. Holly, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes. Um, this is a very important topic, and I'm glad that you brought it up. Uh, I am an attorney. I was handling a pro bono case for the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless last fall and made the error of thinking that I could rely on the online version of the D.C. Code that you find at dc.gov uh, website, only to find out that it is extremely out of date. So even an attorney trying to get the latest uh, information would be misled. Um, it doesn't tell you that it's not up to date, and it, it I mean, I, I finally found the information that I needed, but um, the only way to get the most up-to-date version is to pay for one of the Westlaw or Lexis uh, services, and it's just a tremendous service to pro bono attorneys, even to individuals that just want to find out what is the current law. David Svenich, would our caller Holly's experience be any different today? Not today, but hopefully in about six months it will be. Um, the council has been undertaking a project called the Cranch Project, and I won't bother you with what Cranch is, uh, although if you are an attorney, you've seen the name from Marbury against Madison. Um, the Cranch Project um, is basically an uh, effort to keep the code up to date online uh, uh, in a more timely manner. Codification is a complicated thing. Uh, it usually takes weeks, sometimes months, to keep the code up to date, and it wasn't paper format. That was the norm. Um, but as the uh, as the internet has become the place to go for uh, legal information, it's more and more and more important that we keep the code up to date quickly. And so the council is working on a project. Um, actually, I've been working with Josh Tauber on this project, um, and we think that by this time next year, you'll be able to go on the internet, find the code, have it be official, and rely on it in a court of law. More about William Cranch later, but I wanted to get to this. To stay with this issue for a while, Josh, Tracy, there's a deeper philosophical principle at play here. Government passes laws in service of the citizens of the city. We should be able to see that however we want to see it. And it's extremely problematic if a private company asserts ownership over it. Who actually owns the law? <laughs> well, I guess it depends on who you ask. Uh, there are states that are trying to claim as much copyright as they can over over the law. Um, and uh, when we began this uh, a year ago, D.C. claimed copyright over the D.C. code, and, and Dave can explain um, the strategic reason behind that. Um, but we, we changed that. We're now using a Creative Commons CC0 waiver over the D.C. code so that D.C. waives copyright, and it's, it's now owned by everyone uh, and by no one. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, this is it's changing, and, and we hope that other jurisdictions follow in, in using CC0. Who owns the law? Is it me, I, the taxpayer? Well, um, I'm coming from the perspective that you know, district residents, citizens own the law. Um, and, and that's why there's been this push, or at, least, at least on my end, in the Open Government Office to make this kind of information available. And what I would hope doesn't get lost in the discussion here is that, of course, we've got lawyers and those who are knowledgeable about the district code who are most interested in um, seeing D.C. decoded and looking at the law. But we can't forget that there's an entire segment of the city where their only access to the Internet is through their smartphones. They don't necessarily have a PC. So what I'm also hoping is, too, this is going to have the inevitable effect, in addition to getting people to engage with local government, is that we'll, we'll bring the D.C. code and information about our laws to a larger segment of the city that is traditionally forgotten about. And those are those people 
people who may not have broadband or internet access at home, but who are looking for information about district government and trying to access city services over their smartphones. Holly, does that give you some hope for the future? <laughs> well, I'm I'm curious to know if uh, the DC code decoded is how how up to date that's going to be kept. David. Well, uh, it's dependent on the uh, the underlying DC code. The idea is that once the Cranch project completes this year, then DC decoded will be updated uh, as frequently as the DC code. Um, one thing I should should note, though, on the uh, the copyright issue, because I think this is important, is that uh, the DC official code that is printed in hardbound copy has case annotations. So this is not just the laws that are passed by lawmakers, uh, but also the annotations that are made by the the vendors. And that's where you know the battleground is sort of laid out in terms of the copyright issue. On the actual laws that are passed by uh, elected officials uh, and put together um, by the Codification Council, there's no there's no dispute about that. That is that's public domain. Oh, you invoked the Cranch name twice so far, so I guess we should tell our audience who in D.C. legal history was William Cranch. Sure. Uh, Judge William Cranch was uh, a reporter for the United States Supreme Court. Um, Every law student at some point has seen his name through Marbury against Madison. Uh, But he was also a a chief judge of the D.C. Court of Appeals uh, back in the 1800s. And for our purposes, the reason that he's important is he was also tasked with creating the first code of laws for the District of Columbia. Um, This was not an easy thing. There was a great deal of common law that existed from England and common law from Virginia and Maryland, and it was his job to put together a single code of laws. Uh, Suffice it to say he was successful in putting together a code of laws, although it wasn't ultimately adopted, Uh, and it wasn't until much, much later that we finally got our code of laws in the District of Columbia. We're hoping that the technology will speed this along in our case and we'll have a code of laws that's up to date uh, by the end of this fiscal year. In many ways, the idea of a D.C. code or a United States code, for that matter, was very radical when it was first introduced, and I was surprised just how recent they are. Congress didn't even try to write down a comprehensive list of its own laws until the end of the 19th century. How was law practiced before then? Well, it was complicated. Until the 1920s, the United States Code didn't exist as a corpus. Um, the The way that it would work is that Congress would pass a law, and then a subsequent Congress would pass another law, and it was the job of the lawyers and the courts to try to reconcile all of those different laws. Um, and then at some point in the 1900s, people thought maybe there's a better way to do things, and so they created the United States Code. Um, and I'll tell you, it's it's... It's sort of an early, it's a proto-open government project um, to have all of the body of law in one place. Um, It hasn't been without controversy, um, and I can't say that it's an easy process. Almost half of the United States Code and about half of the D.C. Code is what's called unenacted, and I won't bore your listeners with that. um, But suffice it to say that the Code is a way for the public and for lawyers and for Congress to know what Congress has done in the past. And that was a pretty novel innovation in the 1900s. You're not boring them. Our audience love this stuff. We're taking a <laughs> short break. When we come back, we'll be continuing this conversation on D.C. decoded open data, open government, and taking your calls at 800-433-8850. You can send email to kodrawamu.org. You can all send this also send us a tweet at Kojo Show. What kind of information do you want from your local government? 800-433-8850. I'm Kojo Nand. You're listening to WAMU 88.5. Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Jordan. Right now it's 142 and 36 degrees in northwest D.C. Stick around. Here's what's ahead for next hour. When a drug user turned police informant feared for his life, he turned to two reporters at the Philadelphia Daily News. Their investigation uncovered police misconduct and won them a Pulitzer Prize. We don't feel like police officers should be able to break the law, to enforce the law their new book, Busted, next time on Tell Me More. Tell Me More is just ahead next hour, starting at 2. The D.C. mayoral race is heating up, and WAMU 88.5 wants you to make an informed decision using our D.C. voter guide. Go to wamu.org slash vote, enter your address, and select two candidates to compare their positions on campaign finance reform, affordable housing, and other issues. That's the D.C. mayoral race voter guide at wamu.org slash vote. Get up, stand up. Stand up for your rights. 
Support for WAMU 88.5 comes from National Archives Foundation, presenting Making Their Mark, an exhibit that looks at famous and infamous signatures in our country's history at the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery. Learn more at archivesfoundation.org slash signature. Right now, let's get back to the Kojo Namdi Show. Welcome back. We're talking about DC Decoded, the website dcdecoded.org. We're talking with Tracy Hughes, director of the DC Office of Open Government. Seamus Kraft is executive director and co-founder of the Open Gov Foundation. David Svenich is general counsel with the DC Council. And Josh Tauberer is a civic hacker and founder of GovTrack.us. He did some consulting work for this project. Josh, I use the term civic hacker to describe you, mostly because that was the way you describe yourself. For those who are not familiar with the term, what is a civic hacker? So civic hacking is a creative approach to solving problems in our civic lives. And our civic lives are our interaction with government. So a classic civic hacking case would be building an app to um, help people register to vote and how to uh, understand who the candidates are and so on. So you may be familiar with hacking used a bit differently. Um, so hacking is a, is a homonym. It has two meanings, and there's one that's that's sort of like cybercrime, um, but like words like mouse or um, fluke or gay, these, this word has two meanings. There's another meaning that is about uh, being creative and trying to solve problems in a, in a positive way, and civic hacking is that positive uh, version of hacking. You've worked on these issues for a long time. You created one of the earliest websites allowing citizens to follow legislation as it goes from bill to law with a site called GovTrack. How has this conversation evolved over the past decade or so? Well, it's gotten um, deeper. Uh, when I first started working on this about 10 years ago, there was only a very small community interested in open data. Uh, and since then, there are now um, hundreds just in D.C., thousands of people worldwide interested in open data. Uh, last month, I um, ran with some other folks Open Data Day in D.C. held at the World Bank, and we had 300 people packed into uh, two not-so-large rooms, all interested in using whatever skills they had, not all coders, um, to find some interesting data and uh, understand better things about corruption and uh, D.C. education and um, all sorts of all sorts of things. 800-433-8850. Have you tried to read or download laws of your local jurisdiction? Has technology, in your view, made governments more open and more accountable? Give us a call, 800-433-8850. Or if you have any other questions or comments about open government, you can also send email to kojawamu.org. Tracy Seamus Lewis Brandeis famously said that sunlight was the best disinfectant. The government works best when its functions are in the open. Much of the high-tech conversation about open government focuses on data and programming languages, but ultimately this is really about storytelling, right, about being able to explain how government works, why certain decisions were made. Do you think the current landscape of open government platforms is delivering on that promise yet? Here in D.C., no, um, but I'm hopeful. We're making significant progress. In 2011, a mayor great issued an order that essentially said that all, all district government uh, was to have this transparency plan. And as part of this plan, all of the agencies were to submit their policy for how they're going to make their information and their data available. Um, nothing ever happened on that uh, until I started in this role and have just been nudging them along. Um, now, thankfully, I can say that they have taken my recommendations to heart, um, and much thanks to the coding community and the developer community who have embraced me right away because I quickly learned that I don't know anything about this. I'm just looking at it from the perspective of how I would prefer to see information out there. Um, but we're making very good progress. You know, um, making information available in this way, I think, is just the 21st century extension of FOIA. Um, because people just have an expectation that certain information be made available um, naturally and organically rather than having to go through a formal process. And I think that um, open data in this regard is just a normal extension of that. Seamus, same question. I think it's starting to. Uh, I think you have to start with real people trying to solve real problems in real communities. Uh, we all know the district has lots of problems uh, inside its government and inside the larger community. How can we build information into the solutions there? 
and increasingly people are going online to access information to solve problems in their daily lives or work with constituents to respond to their needs. And I think that that's what we see here with DC Decoded and the larger America Decoded network. If you go to americadecoded.org, you'll see uh, there are other states and other cities in America who are decoding their laws to serve citizens better. There are a lot of there are a few points on that map, but we need to put a lot more. And we're early days in open government and open data. And as this becomes a more regular process for government to put information online with application layers that make that information useful to real people, that's when you'll start to see solutions coming up. Early days is right. It's my understanding. D.C. is only the fifth city in the nation to do this so far. But, Josh, it's one thing to be able to get this code in your hands or onto your computer screen. Another thing altogether to make it make sense. How hard is that? Well, it depends on uh, on the type of data. The DC code is is a very complicated thing, um, and it it takes some understanding to to know where in the code you should be looking for for something. And in fact, knowing where the DC code sits in relation to DC municipal regulations and case law and and, and other aspects, so it it actually it takes a community to invest in some of these before you can um, make heads or tails of it. Uh, I'm a member of Code for DC, and in Code for DC, there's a project about DC the DC education system, and it's taken a large team of, of folks to work with OSI and, um, and local officials to understand what the system is before you can build an application on top of it. But then you get to the end. Hopefully you get to the end of this process and you can really um, build something that people can use. Once Seamus, anything you'd like to add to that? I would agree with that. It, it's very Tocquevillian. Uh, I, I would like to think if, if Alexis de Tocqueville came to America today, this is what he would be writing about because no, no one of us could have done this by ourselves. We've got Tracy and David from inside of government who are looking to serve their constituents better, more accountably, and more efficiently. And you have guys like like me and Josh on the outside who are trying to help those public servants do their job by citizens better. And that's what de Tocqueville was writing about in the, the 1840s, 1830s. Instead of the printing press and those nasty big bound volumes that David <laughs> br- brought with him, we've got iPhones and computers. Tracy, the Bureau of Ethics and Accountability is in charge of the city's ethics laws and it can investigate alleged violations of those laws by D.C. employees. The Open Government Office's Office enforces the Open Meetings Act. What are the rules involving open meetings? Uh, well, essentially what the Open Meetings Act says is that any time that there's a gathering of a quorum of a public body that's gathered to um, conduct district government business, um, that that meeting must be held in open and in the public and that there has to be some um, detailed documentation of that meeting in the form of uh, meeting minutes or a transcript. But most importantly, the Open Meetings Act requires that any time a public body does gather, that members of the public are invited and allowed the opportunity to participate. Um, so, you know, that law has been on the books for a few years as well. Um, and I do have to say, um, in my traveling around the city and training them, there are, I think, close to 190 boards and commissions. Many of the boards and commissions until my arrival um, were very confused about uh, how to apply the law, um, the Open Meetings Act, and many of them didn't even know that it existed. So um, we're, we're still making significant progress, but there's a lot to be done uh, in terms of district government opening its doors and allowing district uh, residents to actually engage with their government. And how can that law be amended in what appears to members of the public and the media to be an arbitrary way? We're talking about the 77-year-old man who died earlier this year of a heart attack after he collapsed outside of a fire station, didn't receive immediate help from the fire station. Officer in charge of that station currently facing charges of neglect through the department's internal trial trial board system and members of the press and the family of the man who died have protested that they have been barred from witnessing the proceedings. Do these kinds of hearings fall under an open meeting statute? And if not, why not? It does fall under the Open Meetings Act, but there are several exceptions to the Open Meetings Act. Um, in particular, what has, is occurring with the trial board, um, there's an exception under the Open Meetings Act that uh, essentially states that any time there's a, um, a public body that is serving as a quasi-judicial matter um, to uh, hear information concerning an investigation, um, which is what was occurring in, in this instance, um, that portion of the meeting can be closed to the public. However, 
What the Open Meetings Act is very clear about is that there should always be made available a portion of that meeting that should be open to the public and that any time a public body is going into a closed session, that has to be clearly indicated on the record. Has your office had a complaint referred to it yet about this uh, no, but I did see all the Twitter traffic about it. Yes. <laughs> so you're expecting yes, one. Yes, yes. David, you and Tracy both work on Freedom of Information Act requests, and it occurs to me that the way that whole process works is quite opaque. Let's say I'm someone on the outside of government interested in contracting because I've got a hunch that something fishy is going on with a specific contract. A lot of what I'm asking for is by nature a guessing game, right? What obligation does government have to make it easier for me or people like me to ask it, the government, difficult questions? Sure. Well, the Freedom of Information Act gives you a right to request documents. Uh, the documents that you're requesting sound like they'd most likely be in the public. Uh, they'd be available to the public. There may be in procurement, uh, there may be proprietary information uh, that need to be kept uh uh, be withheld. But in general, the, the district government has an obligation to respond to you within 15 business days, um, and you have an entitlement, if the district fails to do that, to, to sue us in court. Um, and that's a, a right that's been around since the uh, beginning of home rule, and it's one that I don't see any going anywhere. Could a comment, Trace? Yeah, the, the Open Government Office, um, one of the the nice utilities of the office is that I serve in the capacity as the FOIA officer for the city. So it's my job to make sure that it's an efficient process for both the government and for people requesting information. Um, so people can certainly come to me. Um, and there have been several occasions over the past few months where there's information that should be proactively disclosed is not. I've been able to work with the agencies to do that. So all that the requesters have to do is just go to a link on that agency site for information, but if anyone's finding it difficult to get information, my office is there as a resource, and it's my job um, to work with the agencies to get requesters the information that they're seeking. And my assistant general counsel would kill me if I for saying this, but if you ever have a FOIA request for the council, feel free to email me at davidz at dccouncil.us. Deceased. We, <laughs> <laughs> we got this tweet from at Laura H. Mark. She says her at, open, at, her at DC Open Gov Dream would be a transparent DC public schools budget so stakeholders can demand accountability. To which you say what, Tracy? I say follow Aussie's lead. Um, recently, Aussie uh, released a slew of open data, um, everything that you wanted to know about Aussie. Um, but that was due in large part, and you all correct me if I'm wrong, because there, the coding and developer community was clamoring for this information. So I say D.C. public schools, just follow Aussie's lead. It's not very scary. Just do it. Josh Tauber, this is something you've been working on. Well, I would say come to the next meeting of Code for D.C. Look up codefordc.org, and there are folks there that are, are working on that. David, law is not a static thing. New laws and regulations are passed. Others are struck down by judges. How can we be sure that a law that appears on a site like DC Decoded is actually still in effect? Well, uh, you you can't uh, in an easy way. Um, the code is evolving. It's not static. Uh, there will be laws that are struck down. There will be laws that uh, have changed since the last time the code was published. Um, and the obligation to a certain extent is on the council to keep the code current and so that's that's one of the things they're working on um, but the other the other point is that as Josh sort of noted earlier there has to be an ecosystem that that exists with the DC municipal regulations the DC Court of Appeals the DC Superior Court and others um, that are putting together uh, and putting out information so that it would be easier though not easy uh, for someone to know what the law is at any given point in time Seamus, does data sometimes end up biasing the kinds of stories one chooses to tell? Journalists love to tell stories about money and politics, mostly because there's a common perception that too often our political leaders are up for sale. But it also helps that there are huge databases available that can help tell that specific story since political campaigns have to report where their money comes from. Does that mean that sometimes we are biased towards telling those stories because there's data that can be picked apart and that may mean that we end up missing entire stories entire facets of how power is exercised? I would absolutely agree with, with you on that. And I think it's part of the same reason why you rob banks. Well, that's why the, that's where the money is. Uh, to date, a lot of the money and a lot of the data in politics has been around partisan political campaigns. That's just a fact. And that's where the sexy stories have, have been. We're working on the other 364 days a year. 
uh, w when government can really impact your life, it's when it when members are elected and are in office and are spending your hard-earned tax dollars. Uh, there, there's a dearth of, of good people inside and outside of government working on that because you don't get rich. And uh, we hope to solve that uh, one user by one user with dcdecoded.org. Seamus Crafts is executive director and co-founder of Open Gulf Foundation. Tracy Hughes is director of the D.C. Office of Open Government. Josh Tauberer is a civic hacker and founder of GovTrack.us. And David Zvenich is general counsel with the D.C. Council. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Nandi.